our next uh, our next presenter is Black Car Rider, and she is a student at the University of Sheffield. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And she's going to tell us something about um, creative languages in works of fiction. There she is. Author created languages, and because of the word author in works of literature, things that you read, um, complicating the reading while keeping the reader. Um, my research is um, in the kinds of languages that you find in literature, defining literature broadly here. Um, for this presentation, it's going to be things that are in print, but um, in my research, I take literature to also mean things that are on the big and small screen and also games, um, both role playing and um, card games and things that have fake languages in them. I am looking at all of them. If you have an idea of one that I might not have come across, I beg you to tell me about it. I'm always eager to learn more. Um, so basically, sometimes authors will want to imply a language that does not exist, and they'll make one up, which is great. Um, and so for my research, I'm looking at the cultural and historical contexts um, in which people will do this. And then I would actually look at the textual presentation of those artificial languages to see how readers come to understand what the author means by it. So to begin with, I am not a conlanger. I am a reader. This was after my first trip to the British Library, and I was so ecstatic that I immediately took a picture of my reader card and sent it to my parents. Um, it was basically the best description of myself I've ever seen in life, like a horror writer, <laughs> reader. Um, I have degrees in reading. I read all the time. I hope to get more degrees in reading. When my friend got married and asked me to be a reader at her wedding, that seemed just about right for my life. Um, so my experience and interaction with conlangs is not like many of you actually using them or making them or learning more about them in the natural practical sense. My interaction is through literature. Um, and the thing is, this is true of most people on the planet. You guys are a select, very talented group. I can never hope to be among you. But most people, when they interact with conlangs, it is through literature. And I'm very interested in that experience that people have. Because people don't read books in languages they don't know, except the fact that all the time they do, quite happily. Um, and this highlights that the decision of an author to create a language to use in their work is very important and it's worthy of research. And I'm sad that more people haven't done it, although it makes a good niche for me. Um, and it's because of this effect on the reading experience. Um, text worlds are constructed in the interaction between readers and the language of texts. So it's important to consider the role of the linguistic choices and patterns that we put into these texts. So choosing to alter the mode of communication, the language itself, in a written work is not trivial, um, particularly when the result is something that could seem to readers to be less accessible and more challenging. Um, quoting from Gavins, who some of you actually might know about from conversations I've been overhearing, um, the discourse world can be seen as an act of negotiation and process. Um, what is being negotiated between the participants is the precise nature of the text world that they're creating in their minds in order to process and understand the language at hand. So in other words, in this negotiation pro process, readers will have to work harder for meaning when the text, essentially the dialogue between the author and the reader, is rendered in a language that only one side of the conversation knows about. Um, but this has not dampened people's enthusiasm at all. So. The term author-created language is a deliberate term that I'm using. Um, it's a feature that cuts across genres and time periods. Um, examples cover everything from pre-linguistic kind of grunt things that you find in um, Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, he didn't really go much for actually creating a language for his fake language speakers. Um, all the way to fully formed acquirable languages. And can I get a little wave for Tolkien? Um, so, <laughs> In some instances, they represent a huge project that's been undertaken separate from the creative work of writing a book. Um, and motives for this extra, and I think we have to admit, unnecessary effort for the purposes of book, the motives for this vary widely. Um, it could just be for entertainment. Some people have socio-political objectives. It could be an intellectual exercise. There could be didactic expedience purposes. Um, and of course, for some people, it's to advocate a given language for widespread use. Um, and Tolkien, again, uh, felt that this kind of linguistic labor is inevitable if you educate most people, both many of them more or less artistic or creative, not solely receptive, by teaching them languages. And I'm guessing out of everyone here who 
first time you came interested in Conlang is either through reading a book that had a Conlang in it or learning a language in school. That's pretty much the ways that you come across it and decide this is something I can do for myself. Um, so dabbling in language invention may be unavoidable from Tolkien's point of view, but including fictional languages in literature is not obligatory. Um, so when these cases crop up, we know that something important is being done to the reading experience. It's being deliberately complicated by the author. So how do authors overcome that if they even want to? How do readers react to this? Um, why do some languages engender and inspire a community of speakers? We have a Klingon Language Institute, for example. Um, what methods are used to present these languages to non-native speakers, namely everyone but the author? And what purposes do these languages serve? Now, on that point, and with the slide about naming languages up, several people have asked me about the origins of my name, Lykara, L-Y-K-A-R-A. -A. Does anyone have any guess as to the origin of my name? Greek. Greek is the one I hear most. Any other guess? Sorry? Okay. Character in the book. Character in the book. <laughs> Sorry? Celtic? Celtic? Um, my dad made it up. He wrote science fiction in university to make some extra money on the side, and he needed a character's <laughs> name, and he made up Lycara. Why did he have to do that? Sorry? I don't know. <laughs> Any, yeah? Because he thought it would be um, unbelievable to have people in the 23rd century called John. Exactly. A princess of a galactic empire, which is what Lycara was, um, cannot be named Kate. It's just not okay. Um, <laughs> earlier you were saying it's, it's not okay to have an elf named Jeffrey. It's, it's, it's just not what we expect. It's not acceptable to a reader. So yeah, I'm Lycara. I'm named after the princess of an intergalactic empire. My uncle stole my throne and I have to get it back. <laughs> Do you need some help? <laughs> um, I actually have never read the story. I feel like it would ruin something for me. Um, maybe later in life, I'll go back and find my dad's short story. Sorry, yeah? What about your second name? Sorry? What about your second name? Oh, my middle name is I-N-I-A-N-N. -N. And again, my dad made it up. But that one was mostly by taking the name of Anne and sticking it on the front. Just to slightly less interesting. Well. <laughs> um, right. So, people, names, conlangs. All right. So languages need people to speak them, and I'm sure everyone here is quite familiar with and when their friends question about it, are happy to trot out the anecdote about Tolkien and his languages. He started with the languages and then created books so that his languages had people to speak them. Um, right. So it may follow somewhat logically um, that books containing author created languages have these really strong and obvious things of cultural anthropology. There's a culture, there are people, and they speak this language. Um, and languages come weighted with history and certain world views that predispose their speakers to think about things differently um, than speakers of other languages. And I'm not necessarily screwing to the sticking point of the working and hypothesis, but I'm going to quote a bit from him. Um, we dissect nature along the lines laid down by our native languages. And this is really what people are capitalizing on when they include artificial languages in their literature. Fictional languages encourage and sometimes force readers to adopt, however briefly, a different perspective. Um, so when did authors first deciding that this is something, first decide that this is something that they could do? Who first said, I can actually make up a language and stick it in my book? Well, it um, is first seen in the 17th century, actually. Artificial language development began really in earnest in the 17th century, because at that time, people were seriously considering the nature of language and the ways in which it could be improved. Um, and there are three prominent factors influencing thinking on language and communication that should be held in mind as defining characteristics of that era. First, uh, nearly all reflections were tied up with the contemporary notions of religion as they stood at that time, um, most specifically with the story of Babel. And I'm American, so I say Babel. I apologize in advance if you say Babel and are truly horrified by my pronunciation. Um, but basically, it was assumed that all modern languages were flawed, um, and the multitude of languages on the planet was just evidence of this curse. Um, and global linguistic diversity was pretty worrying as it was, but even within languages, there was imperfection. Um, we had confusing homonyms, there are redundant synonyms, there's irregular grammar, 
It's just a mess, basically. Um, second, it was still the age of exploration at this time, and new lands and new peoples were being discovered, um, and greater contact was being maintained with far-flung places. Um, so a new worldview was being shaped. Um, many reports brought back to Europe were so incredible that they stretched the boundaries of what people were willing to accept as possible um, here be monsters. Um, some of the earliest fictional languages appear in travel narratives. Um, and the value placed on travel writing relative to other literature was much higher than it is today. It was widely read by all classes of readers, um, and it helped to shape the global consciousness of subjects at the center, and I apologize for being Anglo-centric, but it's the only language I know, um, at the center of an expanding British empire, um, and pervasively influenced other literary genres. Um, and finally, third, we have um, created languages were being created then, yeah, um, but at the time it was very closely associated with formal language study as it was then understood. Um, linguists were creating languages. There was no separation between people who studied language and people who created languages. It was all one big group. Um, many early examples were the work of scientists and philosophers, and the languages themselves were seen as very consequential and were much studied and much talked about. Um, it seems that any self-respecting gentleman of the day could be expected to have some sort of universal language on his sleeves, writes Erica Oprint. Um, and when 17th century authors referenced language projects or hinted at fictional languages, they were nodding to a really healthy intellectual culture that respected men who would spend years constructing and describing new vehicles of expression um, for religious or economic or scientific or social purposes. So the first text I'm going to look at is The Man in the Moon. Um, it's written by Bishop Francis Godwin, who had lots of theological writings that you can attempt to read. Um, but uh, he also wrote a paper on secret communication techniques for cities that are under siege. And he uh, had a treatise describing possible long distance communication using homing pigeons and light beacons and stuff like that. Um, and then somewhat confusingly, he also wrote this, um, very much out of character for him. Uh, it was a piece of science fiction. And it's arguably one of the very earliest works of science fiction with, written in English with a created language in it, 1638. If you know of any early examples, let me know. Um, Many of the linguistic ideas that then held currency can be seen directly influencing not only the content, but then also the presentation of his artificial language. Um, because there has to be some shared knowledge with the audience in order for them to correctly interpret what they are being told. So this is a story about a Spaniard named Domingo Gonzalez, who is carried to the moon by geese, which is how it's done, um, and encounters lunar inhabitants, and they're tall, and they're thin, and they're suitably alien looking. Um, and when he sees them, he cries out, Jesus Maria. Um, and everyone on the moon falls down to their knees and starts saying something. Um, he goes through a whole litany of saints. Um, and when he gets to St. Martin, they all bowed their bodies, held up their hands in sign of great reverence. The reason whereof I learned to be that Martin, in their language, must be the word for God. Um, so in this way, they're conveniently Christian, they have the same basic theology he does, the rapport is achieved, they take him in, and they teach him their language. Um, and all throughout, he claims that they don't understand his Latin, which is just baloney, obviously, because his artificial language is basically Latin. Um, he eventually learns enough to be understood, um, using some gestures in there as well. Um, and even though the difficulty of that language is not to be conceived, it consisteth not so much of words and letters as of tunes and uncouth sounds that no letters can express. Um, and he says in uh, the course of this that he's no perfect musician, but he managed to throw together some uh, musical saves for us to understand what was being said. And the first one is, glory be to God alone, and the second one is Gonzalez. Um, and I find it interesting that in English, these expressions both start with a g, and they both start with the same note. Um, just to point that out. Um, and uh, Gonzalez explains to the reader that there are few words because they signify divers and several things, and that they are distinguished only by their tunes. Um, and this is kind of funny, um, but really what he's trying to get around to, it's a rough description of what was then understood about tone languages, um, what was being brought back by travelers going through East Asia. Um, Matteo Ricci, a Portuguese Jesuit missionary, had arrived in China all the way back in 1582 and had been sending back journals and reports ever since. 
Um, and he gained a lot of acceptance. He was famous both in China and in Europe for his work. And he and many other subsequent travelers sent back journals explaining the language, saying that it was, had a very pleasing lyrical aspect and describing a writing system um, where characters apparently directly expressed notions rather than having words. Um, and importantly, it was readable by speakers of different languages. While Gonzalez is on the moon, he lets us know that the tall, thin, suitably alien looking people are the kind of master race, let's say, but there's also a lower class of moon people who are unnaturally short, by which he means human sized. Um, and that the Lunarians account them most base creatures, even but a degree before brute beasts, employing them accordingly in all the basest and most servile offices, terming them by a word that signify bastard men, counterfeits, or changelings. So here, in the very first work of fiction to use an artificial language in English, um, right away we see the trope of untranslatability coming up. Very first work, untranslatable word. The interesting thing is he gives several possible translations but never the actual Lunarian work itself, just claiming that it can't be translated except for this. Um, and the vocabulary that's presented throughout the novel is deliberately small, um, so we can look at very specifically where those words crop up and why those words are being used. And the thing is, they're used to describe the culture, they're used as world-building elements, they're used as formal names. Um, the only non-Latinate created word in the entire novel is the name of the king, Erdonizer, um, and later he comes, is given a gift of some priceless stones um, that have some interesting powers. Um, polyastus, which has heat retention. Um, macris, which is light emission. And abolus, which has an anti-gravity force. Um, and this is basically how the presentation of the language is. He uses Latinate words and sticks them in as world-building elements. And it's not much, and it's not as interesting as most of our modern novels. But it is the first one, and it's quite interesting how and why he did what he did. Um, eventually, he starts worrying that his geese will die and he won't be able to make it home, so he shoves off and gets back to Spain. Um, the next book I'm going to look at is a uh, comical history um, of the state and empires of the world of the moon and sun by Cyrano de Bergerac. And again, I'm American, so I pronounce it that way, and I apologize. Um, and it was a comical romance. It was a picaresque. It was a tale of a narrator going to the moon after being launched into the air by some fireworks. Again, the normal way to do it. Um, and then uh, returns to Earth, but later goes to the sun in a flying machine. Um, that he built while being held captive in a tower. He only meant to glide out of the tower, but somehow magically made it all the way to the sun. Um, mostly, it's a parody of Godwin's Man in the Moon. Um, when he gets to the moon, uh, the people he meets there, they said then, as I had it interpreted to me since, that I was infallibly the female of the queen's little animal. I observed by the muttering and gestures, both of the people and the magistrates, that they were consulting what sort of thing I could be. And by the Queen's Little Animal, he actually means Domingo Gonzalez. Um, in Cyrano de Bergerac's version, Gonzalez was kept as a monkey by the Queen because, according to Gonzalez himself, the short Lunarians are considered beasts, so he's kept as a pet. Um, and Cyrano de Bergerac's narrator is also kept as a pet. They think that he must be female, and so they stick him with the male of the species and hope that they'll make more little monkeys to amuse the Queen. Um, and the important thing here is, as I had it interpreted to me since, I have yet to find a book that doesn't make use of this trope. Um, I had no idea what was going on at the time, but afterwards I clearly remembered everything that happened, and this is an exact transcription of what went on. Very useful. Um, don't even have enough pants. Right. Um, or in, in The Man in the Moon, uh, he didn't spend much time on it, but Godwin, um, in the first book I looked at, he said that there was this musical language that the higher class spoke, but he also mentioned very briefly that there was a gestural language that the lower class spoke. Um, and because Cyrano de Bergerac does satires and comedies, um, he takes this passing mention of gesture and he pulls it to ridiculous extremes, um, basically saying, you must know there are two idioms in that country, one for the grandees and one for the people in general. Um, that of the great ones is no, uh, no more but various inarticulate tones, um, which to our ears sound like music. And the second, which is used by the vulgar, is performed by a shivering of the body. Some parts of the body signify an entire discourse. For example, the agitation of a finger, a hand, an ear, a lip, an arm, an eye, a cheek. 
When they speak, as the custom is, stark naked, their members being used to gesticulate the conceptions move so quick that one would not think that a man spoke, but that a body trembled. So basically, their gestural language is people having seizures. And um, he uses this to great comic effect throughout. Um, and at one point, he's out having a walk, and he wants to make sure he gets back in time for dinner, and he asks a passerby what time it is. Um, and they made no answer, but by opening their mouths, shutting their teeth, and turning their faces awry, um, and when he gets back home late for dinner and he's being scolded, they say, well, how could you not know by that, that they were showing you what time it was? They were using their noses as a sundial. They would turn their head whichever way, whichever tooth that fell on told you what hour it was, because that's how sign language works, obviously. <laughs> um, and the reason this was a useful and interesting thing to put in the novel is that time of, uh, in that time in Europe was when people were first starting to look seriously into sign language instruction. Um, the study of gesture as the vehicle of interaction with exotic people, um, united with the belief that the universal language of images um, could hardly fail to influence the large number of studies which began to appear in the 17th century on the education of deaf mutes. Um, because supposedly there was iconicity of signs, so it had to be an ideal language. The same sign would mean the same thing to the people, no matter where you were, across the globe or on the moon. Um, and many people argue that it was possibly superior to spoken language and that we should just give up talking altogether. So um, if Godwin gave us little musical staves to explain how the musical language worked, how exactly was Cyrano de Bergerac going to represent in print his gestural language? Well, he kind of doesn't bother. Um, he rather, uh, rather than describing an exotic writing system or a bizarre collection of glyphs and emblems, he tells the reader that when it comes to books, they're actually sound recordings, they're tiny little machines. Little machines which seem to me to be wonderfully rich. Um, he was given one that looked like a diamond um, and one that looked like a great pearl cloven in two. And inside them are gears and cogs and places and pages and print. And they work like mechanical books on tape. You wind them up, you set a little hand to a chapter, and it speaks to you. Um, and based on the size of the book being so small, you can carry them in pockets or string them on your belt. Um, and the lack of any need to learn to read, because it's all sound, um, he asserts that teenage inhabitants on the moon are as well educated as old scholars on Earth, because everyone takes with them wherever they go the lectures of the greatest scholars. Um, and he later indicates the existence of a writing system, but doesn't bother describing it because, quote, I have none of their print. So if he had their actual print face, he would have shared it with us, but alas, he did not. Um, he makes it back to Earth at some point and gets imprisoned several times. He really has a terrible time of it. Um, and eventually, trying to escape one time, he creates a flying machine that accidentally takes him to, quote, one of those little Earths that wheel about the sun which mathematicians call sunspots. So now you know. Um, and he starts wandering through a valley, um, and he meets a naked stranger. He's very much into naked people. Um, and the two of them talk for several hours. Um, even though the stranger spoke a language which I knew very well I had never heard before, and which hath not the least resemblance with any of the languages in this world. Notwithstanding, I comprehended it faster and more intelligibly than my mother tongue. And so the narrator asks the stranger how such incredible thing is possible, and the stranger replies that the idiom is more easily understood the closer it comes to truth, with a capital T. Um, in other words, the stranger is explaining that he's speaking the perfect language, um, where words reveal the very essence of things. And the narrator says, well, this must be Adam's lost language. Of course, the original tongue is suitable for speaking to any human or any animal, and he later goes on to talk to lots of animals. Um, and so even with the narrator carrying on in French, and the strange man speaking this new voice of nature, the two of them never misunderstand each other or are uncertain about what is being said. Um, and you'll have to take my word on this because you haven't read the entirety of the work, but there's an interesting progression. When he's on Earth, when he's speaking French to fellow Frenchmen, he's often misunderstood. There's no way that he can actually get through a conversation without somebody mistaking what he's saying. But then he moves to the moon, and while the language there is difficult to learn, it's the clear communication system, and it's universal, and no matter where he goes, once he's learned it, everyone understands it perfectly. And then he moves on to the sun, where he doesn't even have to learn the language. It's just so perfect that it's there, and it's understood, and it's ideal. Um, of course, this means that the reader is never given a description of this wonderful language because he himself just understood it. And the final text I'm going to look at um, is The Consolidator by Daniel Defoe, who is, of course, most famous for Robinson Crusoe. 
um, which is an iconic imaginary voyage um, and actually inspired the term Robinson Aid for any texts that have a similar plot line, let's say. Um, but basically, the book is a description of the narrator's trip to the moon from China on a great winged flying machine called the Consolidator. And it's very much a political satire. I do not recommend that you read it. Creativity has been sacrificed <laughs> for close adherence to contemporary political and religious issues. Um, and unless you're really dedicated and want to know everything he has to say about artificial languages, I wouldn't take the time for a cup. But um, I just want to draw your attention to, on the frontispiece, um, it says right there, translated out of the lunar language. And later on, it was talking about um, a specimen of a very valuable book lately published on the lunar world. So on the front page, this proposition being that the entire rather lengthy text was originally written and published on the moon, which I find fascinating. <laughs> um, so the story itself uh, begins in China, because that's where the narrator happens to be when he catches this great winged machine off to the moon. Um, but while in China, the narrator is really just awed by the great richness and the knowledge and the large libraries, and all of these libraries are filled with non-alphabetic script. Um, and uh, Defoe makes up several Chinese names that are completely ridiculous, and I'm not going to examine them here, um, just to you know, add some treasons to his time in China. Um, but he observes um, that if it be true that the Chinese empire was peopled long before the flood and that they were not destroyed in the general deluge in the days of Noah, it is no strange thing that they should so much outdo us. Um, and the quote goes on, um, so much outdo us in this sort of eyesight we call general knowledge, since the perfection bestowed on nature when in her youth and prime met with no general suffocation. So again, there's this appeal to the veil story of things were perfect, and then there was the Tower of Babel, and there was flooding, and now things are awful. And anyone who managed to escape those curses and those events probably still has a perfect language. Um, the problem was, when it came to China, they had been around for a really long time. And it was somewhat disconcerting. There were conflicting sacred and profane chronologies. Um, and the evidence seemed to suggest that the early dynasties of places like China and Phoenicia had existed, and that their early rulers had lived in antediluvian times which for a lot of people was very upsetting, um, the possibility that someplace other than the cradle of civilization could actually cradle civilizations. Um, so in this way, uh, he goes about setting up the Chinese uh, as natural inheritors of the original and pure Adamic language. Um, uh, and this is a remark on the possibility that many people felt um, an ideal language could still be found somewhere. Many people felt we had to recreate it or just give it up, it's lost altogether. There was a group of people who argued that if we sailed far enough and adventured far enough, we could find the ideal language still protected in some pocket of the world. Um, so there was a, com a combination of new scientific evidence with deep-rooted Christian conventions, and Defoe managed to capitalize on both. Um, basically just to point out the, the negative opinion of the English language, um, and in order to set up a scientifically and religiously based foundation on which to build criticisms of English society and government. Um, and I'm going to talk for a moment about the possibility of neologisms. Um, creation is a particularly problematic category of neologism um, as compared to uh, derivations and compounding and shortening and inflectional extensions and things like that. Um, and uh, Peter Stockwell, who does a lot of research on science fiction and the languages in it, um, asked, can there really be any genuinely new creations of new words or are all words fundamentally implicated in other similar looking words? Um, of course, people can take advantage of this and make up a new word that is rather blatantly supposed to look like an existing word, and Defoe, with his political satire, does. Um, referring to a zealous, fiery sect, he comes up with the word avogratiarian, um, which he's not very particular about the spelling or, I guess, pronunciation of, because he spells it all these other different ways throughout the book. Um, but basically, that was developed from the word abrogate, the verb to repeal or do away with something. Um, and later, I apologize for actually giving this in the Netherlands, um, but uh, later he's making fun of basically the Dutch on the moon, um, and they're called Moganites, and that was uh, a term derived from Hogan Mogan, or high and mighty, which was a contemptuous term for the Dutch at the time. And he was just trying to make clear who exactly he was lambing. Um, 
Sorry? The fence was not big enough. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, and toward the end of the novel, uh, he starts sharing rather extended passages in the lunar language. Um, it's complete gibberish, but it's an extended passage. Um, and it's interesting for a number of reasons, and the most important of which for me is that it's a drastic alteration to the way language has been presented in the rest of the novel, and it has always been presented so consistently. But for the first time, readers are no longer dealing with solitary nouns or words that adhere to English phonotactics. Um, it's gibberish, it has word initial X. None of the words actually correspond to any of the words he's previously taught the reader through exposure. Um, and the translated version also proves that the original text must have contained verbs or adjectives or things that have to be interpreted that way, um, completely unlike anything else he's given us in the rest of the novel. And the passage was introduced with the statement that the poem has to be put in our characters which in our characters may be read as follows. Um, and later he goes on to explain that there's a hieroglyphic writing system. Um, but this is the first time in the novel, and we're already on page 121. Uh, no, I'm using the 2001 version. Never mind. It's very, very far into the book. Um, I think in the original printing, it's page 387. I'm kind of pulling that out of the air. Um, it's really far along. And this is the first time he mentions that on the moon they have any kind of writing system at all, and that it's not a Latinate alphabet. Um, and additionally, uh, when readers were earlier being taught lunar words, like he, uh, the nation on the moon that is the equivalent to Spain is called Ebronia. Well, this poem talks about Spain, or the equivalent of it, and Ebronia is nowhere to be found in what is given as the original lunar poetry text. Um, so he's not terribly concerned about any sort of consistency. consistency. Um, it's more to do with he's providing you with an extended use of text that you don't have to contend with. Readers are not obliged to even try to read the lunar text. It's been Englished below for them. Um, another discrepancy can be seen in the altered rhyme scheme. Uh, the first poem is A-A-B-A, -A -A, um, and then the second version of it is A-A-B-B. -B, um, but for some reason, he decided that on the moon they would still have poetry, that it would still have a rhyme scheme, that it would still have a four-line stanza, um, and the narrator voluntarily adheres to all of that when making up this language, but not the actual rhyme scheme itself. Um, so all of these various effects kind of combine uh, in this really prolonged passage um, to call attention to the role of the narrator, because this person is the reader's translator and also the one who controls all access to genuine meaning. And then when he does get around talking to the hieroglyphic system, um, he says that the writing system on the moon is pictorial, um, different from Chinese. And all these translations have innumerable hieroglyphical notes and emblems painted on them, which pass as comments and are readily understood in that climate. Um, and he gives an example. There's a volume of dialogues. It has two cardinals washing the Pope's hands in blood. Um, I'll leave aside any you know, religious commentary there. But he describes them as though not only are they pictorial systems of writing, but they can actually move, which I find very interesting. Um, and it's important for us to remember that this is being written in a completely different context when it comes to how people thought of hieroglyphics. Um, when Sir Francis Bacon was writing about hieroglyphics and saying in the advancement of learning that they were possibly ideal, it had been a millennium since anyone in Europe had been able to read and understand hieroglyphs. Um, when Defoe was writing this, it would still be another 90 years before the Rosetta Stone was discovered. When Defoe was writing this, it would be another 110 years before it was deciphered. Um, so seeing things that people knew about, didn't understand, thought could be ideal, sticking them in their books for uh, some sort of effect. Um, and basing plausibility in readerly beliefs allows folk theory and authorized scientific theory to coexist. Um, and again, the context of the, these books that he's describing with their hieroglyphical notes, it's in this library that's made up entirely of books that have been taken from Earth and translated into a lunar language. So again, we're looking at a focus on translation, translating, and translators. And this is where I'm going to end the talk now because I hope that you guys have some stuff for me, for the books for me to look at, for their ideas to go into, just so you know where I hope to go. Um, for the purposes of this case study, I reviewed some of the prevailing theories in 17th and 18th century language study, and then related those ideas and principles to a group of texts significant for the use of often created languages. 
um, the intellectual and social context in when novelists first decided to write words that were not words and speech that was not speech, um, it deserves close scrutiny. And what these men did really was remarkable. Um, I know that we're looking at it in a more modern context and saying, well, I bought something at the airport and it's much cooler than this. That may be true. These were the first men to even attempt it or try it and think that it was a possible thing to do in literature. Um, so my goal in my research is to show these links between formal linguistics at any given period and creative writing of that time to reveal not only the premise on which those languages were formulated, but also the information that audiences would have used to understand and interpret the fabricated languages. Um, things that I want to do in my research, I want to continue following history up to the present day um, and look at the various emerging ideas of linguistics and how they can be seen in literature. I'm going to look at education reforms because when Tolkien was saying, if you educate most people with the language, then obviously they're going to do that. Well, speaking for the US and other places, uh, the language standards have really, really dropped, <laughs> let's say. Um, so I'm going to look at how that has had an effect on the way people go about describing and creating languages for their works of fiction. Um, I'm also going to start collecting up more tropes of language presentation. Um, I showed you some examples in very first books of the trope of untranslatable words or concepts, but there's also the trope of the main character being fantastically good at acquiring languages in two weeks or less. Um, there's the trope of the narrator being actually employed as a translator or interpreter on a ship or in a far-off galaxy. Um, there's the theme of linguistic anthropology, so there's this whole subsection of literature as sci-fi anthropology or anthropological sci-fi. Um, and I want to look more into theories of onomatopoeia, um, because how else do people go from looking at black marks on a page and deciding how they might sound? Um, the answer is that they rely on the reader's knowledge of the phonological system of spoken English and the graphological system of written English. So although they're not words and sentences, they mimic words and sentences. And it's this mimicry that allows us to understand them. So I'm going to spend more time looking at theories of onomatopoeia. Um, and I hope to spend time looking at anything you guys care to suggest to me. Thank you very much. So you're only looking for examples from the 17th century? I'm starting there and going forward. I mean, eventually I have to get to C.J. Cherry. I can't not look at C.J. Cherry. <laughs> yeah. It's my wife's favorite writer. Uh, I don't know why people uh, spit on the Dutch language when there was a book in the 17th century, I think, that proved without any doubt that uh, Dutch was the language that was spoken in the Garden of Eden. Yes. <laughs> also, the same argument was made for Hebrew and German, and um, Jonathan Swift makes fun of all of these theories um, in Gulliver's Travels. Yeah. People. A lot of years ago, they wanted to find out which was the original language of Adam, and uh, one king made a, an experiment. He brought up some children without, and, and he had the people who took care of them speak no words to them at all. And he wanted to find out which word they would uh, pronounce spontaneously by themselves, and that would obviously be the natural language of people. And the first sound that was identifiable was bekos, which was the Phrygian word for bread. So they decided that Phrygian was the language of. Uh, the natural language of man, the language of Adam, whatever. The language words. you would speak if you hadn't been tainted by all those other languages. Exactly. Yeah. Although, I, in, in practice, I think people who grow up without language don't acquire one at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the writer that got me really interested in language you may not have heard was Jack Chalker. Jack, how do you spell his name? Um, Chalk, as in you run the world with it, the R. And he didn't actually use languages per se, but he was aware that languages were different. And even though he had universal translators, he had one character straight from another. Do you realize if we didn't have this translator, we couldn't even hear each other, let alone understand each other? Okay. All right. And what was the first book that uh, had naturally elaborate uh, constructed language? Um, I think people are going to argue about that. I don't personally have an opinion because I haven't decided yet on um, what counts as elaborate and what just counts as a naming language. I think people have this discussion among themselves in the past. Um, I just, I'm trying to develop a massive database of books and then just look at how they relate to what people were then thinking. Um, the thing is, when, when these books were being written, um, whoever was going to read them was going to have to have enough money to buy the book and be well enough educated to read it. 
And if you were in that category, you were likely to know about what the, the current, the contemporary theories of linguistics were. Um, today, you do not need to be educated in much of anything to buy a book and read it. Um, so the reading audiences, um, their relationship to the formal study of language is quite different for modern audiences than it was then. And I'm, I'm hoping to look at the, where that changed and why it did and how authors overcome that. And, how authors can know nothing about linguistics and still feel perfectly confident writing the language, and they must be right because they're bestsellers. And yeah. Some works that may not be as well known as others. Okay. Um, there's Janet Kagan's novel House Spark. There is Scott Westerfield wrote a adult science fiction book a long time ago called Fine Prey. A.C. Crispin wrote a series of books, I think the first one was called Starbridge. And then Sheila Finch wrote a whole bunch of short stories. And those are the only ones I can think of off the top of my head that you might not have heard of before. I, I wasn't writing fast enough. Crispin something? Crispin? And Crispin, A.C. Crispin. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, um, I, uh, first of all, I have a suge uh, suggestion, don't know whether, uh, I don't know the author by heart, but um, the title is Anathem. Yes. Ah, yeah. <laughs> you know it. Yes. Ayn Rand. <laughs> no, it's not, yes, uh, it's not Anthem by, uh, uh, yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> and of course, The Dispossessed, but I guess you know that. Yeah. <laughs> Great language. Um, and the other question, um, See that you um, that you are interested in this area. What would you suggest to a contemporary author um, to do if uh, introducing languages? In a... um, what would I suggest to a contemporary author to do? Um, don't use apostrophes. <laughs> 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 assume that because you taught the reader how to understand a word or a phrase or whatever that they will remember later. <laughs> um, you can spend a lot of time building up, um, we're going to try and not talk too much text world theory. You can, uh, like when you're learning a, a natural language, the more someone uses a word in context, the more likely you are to remember it and to use it correctly yourself. It's not always the case in artificial languages in books because people if they feel it's too difficult for whatever reason, like it has an X and an H next to each other, um, if people feel it's too difficult, their eyes will skip over it. People will also skip over it just in actual like reading theory, research that's been done. People are more likely to skip over it if it's in italics for whatever reason. So when you're actually typesetting your page, don't put your non-natural language in italics. Oh, that's, a, that's a good suggestion. <laughs> Thank you very much. And by the way, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Let's see. No. Have you read Ludwig Holbein? Have I read Ludwig Holbein? Lewis Klims and the Grand Journey. Oh, yes, I have. And yeah. <laughs> I must be his name wrong in my head because it didn't ring a bell. But yeah. Any other favorite books? Have you become my favorite book? What is your favorite? Um, it changes. Um, is that a good one? <laughs> <laughs> it changes. Um, uh, I, I, I have to admit that I'm, I'm somewhat obsessed with pretty much anything CJ Cherry writes. I think that might be when I finally decided that I could convince academic people who don't read science fiction that I could do academic work on science fiction, um, but that was just a personal journey. I don't know if anyone else feels that way about a particular author of the series or anything. So what did you think of the sequel? It, was, uh, it changes? Uh, no, Psyche. <laughs> Sorry? The sequel to Psyche. Oh, um, actually for me it was the translator, um, interpreter, inheritor series. Yeah. Or the series. Sorry? Or Yes, thank you. It's been a bit of a busy day. 
Uh, there is a, a short passage in in uh, 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 Mo, Momo uh, that the whole capacity of the book is dominated by, by the children's book by uh, Michael Engel and, and the, the main character, the, 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 the girls. Um, she she is, is, she is she is playing with the other children and then, then she says set, set up something uh, um, uh, uh, some sentences in, in a in a language she she, she would would have thought up and and you, you when you read it you you see that is it is not just just uh, just uh, uh, running over the typewriters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you, you, the words are re some words are repeated and and you have you have a translation uh, a bit bit more down the page and then then you then you can identify. Well, what what is what does mean what? Okay. Okay. And, and it is. I might need to use the spelling of that from you later. But yeah, I'm cool. I'm cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got a question from Isabel from um, IRC. Did uh, the question was did uh, change choice use creative languages in Finnegan's Wake, or did he just use various standards? Um, the most of the theory of automatopoeia that I'm going from is based on James Joyce and Finnegan's Wake, and a lot of it comes from Derek Atridge, and he sees the language in Finnegan's Wake as being creative, but not necessarily creative, um, and he bases a lot of his interpretation on it being something that you're meant to be so confused by that you try saying it out loud, and therefore it's an automatopoeic language. Did that follow? Yes, sir. Um, but that's his interpretation of it. I'm going to be completely honest. I've never had the patience to stick through all of Finnegan's Wake, even though I've pretended to teach on it to uh, undergrads. <laughs> Poor things. <laughs> um, I got the word for thunder on the first page, and that's about as far as I know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah? Are you also interested in acemic compounds like the whole lambic? Um, in what was it, Zero Rose? Or, Zero Rose. Yeah, who, who sang songs in the conlang in the sense that they are words that he made up, but they are not intended to have meaning. It's more like um, the feeling you get when you hear them is the content of the song or something like that. Okay. So it doesn't have grammar or something, but it is invented words, and I think he called it whole lambic. Okay. There is a French group, which, if I remember correctly, is called Magma, yeah. okay. who's uh, uh, who's singing in a. It's basically a head metal group, and they're singing in the corner, but it's supposedly a really uh, defined corner with a grammar. It's not just uh, uh, euphonic words. It's really. Uh, it, it's really uh, made with actually a background control show with it. Okay. It's, uh, I don't know it by myself because I've never been too much into a heavy metal. Right. But uh, I, I knew somebody who talked to me about it and said that it was really it, it was really de uh, uh, developed. Although there is, as far as I know, uh, nowhere a, a real grammar of it, not even online or anything. Okay. Keep it under. And the rest will be singing it. My question was going to be: Is the audience expected to know it when they hear? Well, they get kind of uh, uh, a primer on it. Well, basically, it's mostly in terms of pictures on the uh, on their albums. They have pictures of, of what it's supposed to represent. And so it's kind of a. I think it's a, it's a story of intergalactic war and. Uh, I think actually a princess that was taken, uh, uh, that uh, lost her throw or something like that. It's happening all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, for the purposes of, just so people know, apropos of nothing really, um, the purposes of my research is to look at those 
uh, contexts in which an author gives a language with no expectation that the reader will come to it knowing anything about it. Um, which isn't to say that like books written in Esperanto aren't important or aren't worthy of research. Um, it's just when when people come to that text, there's an expectation that they'll actually know it, even though it is a created language. Um, and I'm kind of looking at uh, just my own personal interest is in when um, every book is a language contact situation, that you're always an L2 speaker of whatever you're reading. Um, so I find it interesting that there isn't necessarily an expectation that people will, like, know the language before they buy the CD. Uh, then the, the, uh, for that uh, expect that you've heard about uh, Frédéric Verst, of, uh, uh, but that's actually very, very new. He's just a few months ago uh, uh, published a book in a French publishing uh, company, quite a big one, okay. called uh, 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 War of Art. I don't know exactly how you pronounce it, which is basically uh, an anthology of texts in a constructed language okay. with, a fr uh, with French translation and comments. Okay, can you get details on that for me later? Yeah, yeah. No problem. Thank you. And on the topic of languages, there are quite languages. Dance can dance. The group. Okay. At least the singer Lisa Gerard sings in Glossolalia, and okay. myself, I pretend it's a language I don't understand <laughs> and give it the meaning I want to have. But she does that quite expressly, and it does sound like a language, even if it's not. Okay. And you probably have Atlantis, where. He uses his knowledge of proto Indo European or something to understand. Does he film? Disney has a film with the creative yeah. language. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 really surprised, right? It's from the same main cast of Green. Green? Okay. Also by Mark Orkin. Uh, he, he basically learned proto Indo European or, some, or he knows that and he uses that to establish context, kind of contact with them because obviously they're so old, so their language is close to proto Indo European or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Thank and um, another interesting one is a, by a Dutch writer, um, Alton Spokane in uh, Neuver, um, <laughs> Away in Spokania, Never Away, or something like that. Basically, it's an armchair traveler's guide to Spokania. Somebody made up a con world um, and writes it as if it were a travel guide of that place so that you can experience the place without having to leave the comfort of your own armchair when reading the book. And uh, as part of his con world, he also has Spokane in the language, and that's something he's been working on since he was very young. Great, um, so you. that, that contains bits on in the con language as well. He still has the book, I think, right? Uh, it even has a little gramophone record inside it where you can listen to Spokane. I, <laughs> I have it. <laughs> Okay, not here. and um, I just uh, thought of some other suggestions which you might not know. Yeah. First of all, um, label 17. Yeah. Ah, okay. And um, the city and the city. Chinam, yeah, it's on my to read list. I don't actually have access to it. Ah, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, it um, also describes the um, um, construct, uh, it also describes the languages of um, Alkut and uh, Urkut and Rengel uh, it. Um, not really much. It uh, does not actually give it, um, examples, but it um, explains a bit of um, how the alphabets are. How um, so, uh, it actually names only one, uh, only one thing uh, actually in the language, which is a, uh, which is the name of a drug. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But um, yeah. Um, apart, um, it does explain a bit about the language, and it's. Uh, uh, explains that if you just use the stems, for example, of, the, um, of uh, these words, they are similar enough that you are understood in both languages. Okay, thank you. Tintin? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mark Rosenfeld has a page on analyzing the Sildavian, if I can reverse engineer it. I don't know for sure, but uh, the, 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 the part about music made me think of a group called Urban Tread, T-R-T-R-A-D, which I think also sings in a self-made uh, language. So uh, the question is, can you think of a book which starts in English and gradually introduces you to a different language, maybe you travel to a different country or something? It ends up with pretty much all the words substituted. Mm -hmm. 
I can't. Uh, you know? Can you, do you know of one? Not exactly, but in um, Nigeria, there's a sort of pigeon English. Right. And Chinua and Chibi begin, writes most of his book in plain English, but he begins with a character arguing with his girlfriend, and she can only speak the pigeon. Right. And towards the end, the main characters begin speaking the pigeon itself. And by then, hopefully, the readers will understand it. Okay. Um, actually, I usually present my kind of research at colonial conferences because those are the other people that are used to reading books with the language that they don't necessarily know. Kind of sort of. A clockwork orange. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you are familiar with the work of the Polish writer Andrzej Sapkowski. Mm -hmm. Well, you should. It's, okay. uh, <laughs> How do I quite an elaborate uh, language and whole series of books. Okay. So, of course. Okay. <laughs> As you say. <laughs> uh, for the rest, now one thing that comes into my mind is, I unfortunately I don't remember the name of the author or all of the book, but the language is named Baron. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. You can find it in Wikipedia. It's Baron, B-H-R-O-N-H. Oh. I think there's an anime uh, called Crest of the Stars or something like that. Yeah, right. Okay. As far as I've heard, that's quite a good one, actually. Oh. Based on old Japanese. Yeah, it's based on Japanese, on some kind of Japanese. And you also see that the sounds are based on Japanese, a little bit. But uh, it's not a rip off. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh, one more. Uh, no, two more, actually. First, uh, Václav Havel. Yeah. The president used was a writer before he became president, and he used actually even two constructed languages in his own work. Okay. Although I've been told that those languages were created by his brother. I'm not sure if this is true. Okay. Um, and there's one other thing was a that's a music the Hungarian composer George Ligeti. Is also known, but also I don't know. I think he told it in an interview I heard once that he was also a comrade and used some constructed stuff in his opera, Le Grand Macabre. Okay. I just want to add an, an advertisement to the Baron and Crest of the Star. That way, age you can learn the script. <laughs> Time for me to let somebody else talk now, and then I can make it possible. Okay. Can I say that? Yeah. There, there is a <coughs> translation of the, 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 the different prints mm -hmm. in, in old, old High German, and, uh, and it is a uh, uh, that and the the woman who translated that made made it uh, into a literal language, and she she has um, many new new words, and she uh, and she did, did uh, ch change back mid mid high German words in, into into old high German which didn't exist then um, didn't exist then and and it uh, got uh, uh, more more regular uh, orthography and it and it's uh, the, the, I, 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 for me, it's the only, only book, book in, a, in a modern sense uh, written in, in that language. Okay. Uh, uh. 
you know of unclasped fish beholding? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is, well, yeah, it's basically what one of the many attempts to show what English would look like if it were purged of Romance and Greek roots and use just Germanic words. And it's nearly impossible to understand, even though all the roots are English. If you know German, some of the things help a little bit, like sour stuff. In German, it's Sauerstoff for oxygen. And he basically has a bit on basic science or basic physics, but using only German words, even though usually for science we think we need Latin and Greek. Right. But, so, yeah.